Hi, my name is Barry Wolverton. I live in Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, I'm excited to be here. I'd be more excited to be there, but um, that's uh, unfortunately not possible this year. Uh, I am the author of four books of fiction for adventurous readers of all ages. My first book was called Never Sink, A Puffin Saga, which as you might guess is the adventure of a puffin, a reluctant hero forced to save his island home. <clears throat> Then I wrote a trilogy uh, called The Chronicles of the Black Tulip. The first book is The Vanishing Island. The second book is The Dragon's Gate. And <clears throat> the thrilling conclusion to the trilogy is called The Sea of the Dead. I think I've been advertised to read from The Vanishing Island, so I'm gonna do that. Uh, you're probably wondering what The Vanishing Island is about. <clears throat> and since publishers work so hard on the copy they put on the uh, inside the, the dust jacket flap, I'm going to read that and then I'll read chapter one. Does The Vanishing Island really exist? And if so, what treasure or terrible secret was hidden by its disappearance? It's 1599, the age of discovery in Europe. But for Brent Owen, growing up in the small town of Map on the coast of Britannia has meant anything but adventure. Enticed by the tales sailors have brought through Map's port and inspired by the arcane maps his father creates as a cartographer for the cruel and charismatic map mogul named Rand McNally, Brent is convinced that fame and fortune await him elsewhere. That is, until his repeated attempts to run away land him a punishment worse than death, cleaning up the town vomitorium. It is there that Bren meets a dying sailor who gives him a strange gift that hides a hidden message. Cracking the code could lead Bren to a fabled lost treasure that could change his life forever and that of his widowed father. But to get there, he will have to tie his fate to a mysterious Dutch admiral obsessed with a Chinese legend about an island that long ago disappeared from any map. Before long, Bren is in greater danger than he ever imagined and he will need the help of an unusual friend named Mouse to, to survive. <clears throat> so, uh, the book starts with a prologue that some people tell me is a bit scary. So I'm going to start with chapter one. The summer began with a grim morning, but the wolves were running again. In Britannia, this was code. It meant that Her Majesty's Navy was in need of fresh bodies to replace all the seamen lost during the year to disease, desertion, or battle. Crimping, they called it. Men and older boys kidnapped and forced to enlist for the good of God, queen, and country. Britannia, after all, was just one of many nations fighting for nothing less than to control the world. One boy who didn't have to worry about being crimped was Bren Owen of Mac, the dirtiest, noisiest, smelliest city in all of Britannia. Bren was what they call spindly, tall for his age, but unsteady, like a chair you might be afraid to sit on. He had been born in Mac because he had no choice in the matter, but that didn't mean he had to stay here. And now, too skinny for the wolves, he had been forced to take matters into his own hands. He finished the last of three letters he was writing and sealed each of them with a few blobs of candle wax. Two of the letters he stuffed into his knapsack. The third he left on the kitchen table under a half empty bottle of cabbage wine before slipping out of the shabby clappered house he shared with his father. Bren's first stop was a pub called the Gooey Duck. The moment he walked in, a serving maid named Beatrice grabbed his sleeve and steered him into a small table in the corner. Where have you been at, Bren Owen, she said. In a minute, she was back with a steaming pot pie and stale bread. Eat, you're all cheekbones and no cheeks, boy. He poked at the savory pie's bubbling crust, which pulsated like a lung. Everything in Britannia was served in the form of a pie, a pudding, or a leg, and you were better off not knowing much more than that. But Brent had never come to the duck so much for the food as for the conversation. This was a place where stories were told by men practiced in the art of telling them. It was here that he had overheard the man who claimed to have been with Sir Walter Raleigh when he went to resupply his colony in Virginia, only to find that the entire settlement had vanished. At the very table he was sitting at now, he had listened with awe to a Spaniard describe a city of gold in the jungles of the New World and the Amazon warriors who guarded it. He had once sat next to a Venetian who claimed to be the great great something of Marco Polo, whose adventures in China still fired men's imaginations. Sometimes he would be caught eavesdropping and a grizzled seaman would give him the snake eye often with the only eye he had left. But Bryn didn't care. The Knights of St. James Sword, the Order of Santiago, the Brotherhood of the Drake, these were just a few of the fraternities of explorers he had longed to join at one point or another. It was one thing to see a new world appear on a map for the first time, but it was something else entirely to imagine being the one to discover it. 
Tonight, though, Bren was focused on just one sailor, a Brit named Roderick Keyes of the Royal Expeditionary Navy ship Tempest. Bren had first noticed him three days ago. Actually, Keyes was impossible to miss with a mustache the size of buzzard wings. The Tempest was bound for Britannia's new colony in Jamaica, where apparently they had grass made out of sugar. Bryn, who had eaten a steady diet of root vegetables his whole life, could imagine nothing better. When the sailor Keys left, Bryn made his move. He followed him to the Tempest, to where the Tempest was moored, hiding behind a stack of barrels until the coast was clear. After what seemed like forever, someone said, what are you bloody doing? And Bryn nearly jumped out of his clothes. He looked up. It was Ryder Keys, more mustache than man. Me? You're the cargo man for these, yeah? Bryn thought about it. Yes, sir. And let's go, said Keyes. Start with this one. Bren bent his knees to lift the barrel and nearly separated his arms from his shoulders. What are you doing, said Keyes. Roll it, man, roll it. He looked, took a closer look at Bren. Gah, you're just a boy. I just started, said Bren. With a deep sigh, Keyes pushed the barrel on its side. Like this boy, like this. Bren helped Keyes roll the barrel along the pier and up the gangplank onto the deck. It was still almost more than he could manage. By God, you're spindling away. I know, said Bren, panting. He looked back at the deck. Only six more to go. It was perhaps an hour later when they finished, and Bren knew he had to think fast. He had read dozens of books about ships and seafaring, planning out the best way to sneak aboard and the perfect place to hide. But when he looked around, Ryder Keys was gone, and the hatch below was wide open. It can't be this easy, he thought, not wanting to jinx it. But he couldn't help himself. The feel of the gently rocking ship beneath his feet thrilled him. And he had to fight the urge to go running across the deck and climb the mast. Bren went to the hatch leading below decks, planning to hide in the cargo hold, but someone was coming up, so he scampered to the front of the ship, up the steps to the forecastle deck, and hid behind the mast. Peeking out, he watched as a man sat down on the top step, pulled out a pipe, and began filling it with tobacco. Suddenly, someone yelled, No smoking on deck! Since when, said the smoker? Since all that black powder came aboard, replied the other. Bren realized he was talking about the barrels he had helped load. They were full of gunpowder. As the man's bowl of tobacco glowed a threatening red, Bren felt something tickle his leg. He looked down and saw a black wharf rat the size of an otter, and before he could stop himself, he screamed and kicked the thing away with such force that it flew all the way across the forecastle, hitting the smoking man in the back. The man jumped up and spun towards Bren, reaching for his pistol, and in the process, dropping the lit pipe. Everything seemed to stop. Bren looked at the man who looked at Bren. They both seemed to be thinking the same thing. One small pipe couldn't possibly ignite a sealed powder can. That was the last thing he remembered before the explosion. That's it for chapter one. I'm happy to take some questions. Looks like we have one from Brad Murray. Did you re do research on pirates or just create everything? Also, can you talk a little bit about your writing process and what am I working on now? All right. Uh, I did do research on pirates. Um, I did a, I, this book is set in an alternate seafaring age, uh, as you might have gathered. <clears throat> uh, but I wanted, uh, I wanted to create a realistic life of, of what it was like for a boy uh, living in a poor town in 1599, give a sense of why he might take a risk to stow away on a ship to escape uh, because of his lack of opportunity and how hard his life was. But then once he's on the ship, I definitely wanted to give a realistic sense uh, of what it was like to be on one of these ships that sailed uh, around the world in the 16th century and the 17th century. Um, these sailors could uh, be stuck on a ship for up to two years at a time without ever getting off, eating the same food and drinking the same water uh, that they had started <laughs> left port with. So it was really something. And I wanted to, I wanted to recreate that, uh, that sense of reality. But I did make up a lot of stuff. I, I made up my own uh, terms for uh, some of the nicknames the, the sailors use and the slang they use because I wanted to, you know, it is something in alternate history and I wanted to make it my own. Um, as for my writing process, uh, I, not one of those writers who tries to write a certain number of pages a day. I sort of go with how I feel. Um, I usually, either write early in the morning or on weekend afternoons because I do have a day job. And I, I just go with the flow. I'm sort of a, I think they call it a pantser. I fly by the seat of my pants. I don't do a lot of rigorous outlining. Maybe I should. <laughs> uh, 
Um, but that's, that's how it works. Uh, Sonia Turner asked, what was your favorite book you made so far? That's a tough one. Um, I still have a soft spot for Never Think, which was my first book. Um, it was really a joy to write. I wasn't under contract. I had no idea anything about publishing. I didn't even intend to write for kids. I just had this story I wanted to tell uh, about puffins, which I thought were severely underrepresented in literature compared to penguins. <laughs> and so I, this, this story sort of sprung into my head and I wrote it. Uh, and uh, oddly enough, I'm on the panel for Watership Down tomorrow. I used to describe Neversink as if P.G. Woodhouse had written, or Terry Pratchett had written Watership Down. But anyway, it's it's an adventurous book. It's a fun book, um, and I since it was my first, I, I still consider it my favorite. Let's see, what did I like to read when I was a kid? Um, well, I like to read a lot of the books I'm writing now. That was I, I was sort of inspired by my nostalgia for uh, with Never Sink with the animal fantasies that my mom used to read uh, with me when I was a kid. Jungle Book, uh, Uncle Wiggly, which most of you probably <laughs> have forgotten about. Um, Mouse and the Motorcycle, Stuart Little, Charlotte, what, Charlotte's Web. I love books with talking animals in them and I wanted to put my own spin on that. Uh, same thing with uh, The Vanishing Island, The Chronicles of the Black Tulip. You know, I, like a lot of readers at that age group, I loved, you know, reading about adventures. And, you know, I, I grew up in Jackson, Mississippi, not the most scintillating town imaginable. So, uh, books that took me to exotic places and adventurous lo locations and put the hero in danger were very exciting to me. That's what I liked to read. Any more questions? Requests? Would you like me to sing? Ginger asked, did I have the entire trilogy planned at the beginning? <clears throat> Sony asked me to read chapter two. Well, uh, I'll answer Ginger's question and uh, if we have time, I, I will. Uh, did I have the entire trilogy planned at the beginning? No, I, in I originally intended The Vanishing Island to be a standalone book and I had sort of mapped it out, no pun intended that way. Uh, my editor thought the story had bigger possibilities and asked me to consider it as a three book series. Um, so that, that was the biggest struggle writing the book because I had to, I had trouble finishing book one because now suddenly it had to have an ending but not have a complete ending. And that's a tricky thing in writing a series, a trilogies or books, you know, any series, you know, how you want the reader to leave satisfied with uh, the book they're reading, but also still want more. Um, once I got the the entire three book story arc mapped out, then books two and three were a lot easier to read. Are there any audio books for you? Series? Not for the Vanishing Island. Uh, there's an audio book for Never Seen, but not for the not for the uh, Treasure Hunt. I'll, uh, I'll leave it up to Brad whether uh, you want me to wrap up or start on chapter two. Am I working on anything new? I am. Uh, I've got two books written, uh, one that my agent's currently trying to sell and one that uh, we're still polishing. Um, how much do I want to give away about that? All right, one, the book that's finished, uh, I was really inspired in my writing. If you read Never Sink and you're a fan at all of sort of British nonsense and absurdist writers, uh, you'll see a lot of influence there. And so 
<clears throat> I'm, I have written sort of a quirky biography of the British nonsense writer Edward Lear, who you may not be as, I, I, I know most Americans aren't as familiar with as they are Lewis Carroll, even though Lear um, you know, actually preceded him and may have influenced him. Um, and so uh, I really hope to in, uh, introduce more American kids to uh, one of my favorite writers. Um, anything you would change now that they are published? Yes, I would go back and rewrite everything. That's the, that's how I'm wired. I'm one of those writers like, uh, Henry James that, you know, would, would love the opportunity to reread everything. Okay. I've got a couple of requests to start on chapter two and we have about 15 minutes. So, um, I will do that. <clears throat> so after the explosion, Chapter two, The Trial of Bryn Owen, Rapscallion, Liar, and Thief. At the fall of the Roman Empire, a tribe rose out of the bogs of the north. They were led by a powerful king who claimed the lowlands from the sea by marshalling earth against water. Thus was he called Rotter Van Dam, or Rotter of the Dams. King Rotter unified all the tribes of the lowlands, and having conquered the waters once, he launched an ambitious plan to build a navy and plunder his neighbors by sea. They turn the waters red with the blood of their enemies and ground their bones to make garden paths. Their long distance raids from parts unknown eventually gave a name to their people, the Netherlanders. Among the first plunder it brought back for King Rotter was a very young orange tree, the first of its kind ever seen in the West. Forever after, the orange became the symbol of the royal house of the Netherlands. Bren, are you getting ready up there? Bren ignored his father and returned to his book, The Conquering Orange, which he had read so many times the binding was falling apart. He knew the real story wasn't quite so sensational, but for once, the truth was plenty good. Netherlanders had claimed the jewel coveted by all ever since Marco Polo had returned from his travels to the empire of Kublai Khan. Colonies in the Far East, and an absolute mon monopoly on trade there. He was on the small cot in his, in his sleeping loft. He had been uh, under house arrest since the accident, and his left arm bandaged from his forearm past the elbow. Besides the cot, the elf code was empty, save for the small writing desk and a flower pot that sat in one window. The pot was filled with dirt, and buried there was a tulip bulb. Bren had purchased it for a shilling from a grab bag at a fair during the Dutch tulip frenzy. Given the price people were paying for tulips at the time, Bren was sure he'd hit the jackpot, that some rare species would flower and make him rich. But the bulb had never sprouted. Suddenly, a large cat flew through the window, brushing the small flower pot and sending it on a wobbly orbit along the sill. Mr. Gray, where have you been, said Bryn. Have you forgiven me for trying to run away? He reached out to pet the cat, now on the end of his cot, who purred contentedly for, contentedly for several seconds before chomping down on Bryn's hand and jumping off the bed. Ow! I guess I deserved that. Bryn, it's time, his father called from below. Bryn sighed and closed his book. As he put his boots on, he glanced at his walls, which were covered with parchment he had pinched from Rand McNally's map emporium. His father worked there as a map maker and had long planned for Brent to follow in his footsteps. But so far, the only maps Brent had drawn were those from his, his imagination. Britannia didn't even exist in this room, only the fantastical lands of the Orient and the Far East, the Mughal Empire, Empire with its tigers and elephants, the Dragon Islands and Dutch Siam, the island of the orange apes, and of course, China itself, the forbidden kingdom, populated with monkeys, leopards, and lions, as well as unicorns, dragons, basilisks, and beasts, half man and half dog, all creatures described by Marco Polo in his famous travel book. Bryn had drawn the legendary palace of Xanadu with its gold roof and gold floors, and the red pearls that floated like jellyfish on the South China Sea. Bryn, his father called again, and Bryn turned away from his childish drawings. Hear that, Mr. Gray? It's time for my trial. If they execute me, I leave all this to you. Mr. Gray yawned. Map's Royal Court of Justice was one of three large stone buildings that surrounded the town square. To its left was the Church of the Faithful, the State Church of Britannia. And facing the church from across the wide lawn was the largest building of all, McNally's Map Emporium. This was where sailors from all over came to buy and sell the newest, most valuable, and rarest maps in the world. The church offered salvation, but McNally's offered prestige. It had put map on the map and given it its name. Bren and his father approached the court along a path still festooned with Chinese lanterns, left over from the exhibition of Oriental wonders that had been held in the spring. Bren had spent every penny he had to see the exhibition twice, but it was worth it. He'd gotten to see a coconut, elephant tusks, the hide of a snow leopard, and a machine that hurled rocks. He had held chopsticks and flown a kite, 
and he had seen a real dragon skeleton. He knew it was real because it didn't have wings like the fake dragons of Western mythology. Bren and his father were led inside by a bailiff who might have been as old as the court itself. Bren's father was wearing the only suit he owned. Bren was wearing a rough tweed jacket two sizes too large for him that his father had bought him. This jacket itches, said Bren, and they waited and waited. Hush now, said his father. Finally, the chamber door opened and the judge took his seat. The elderly bailiff opened a scroll and stared at it, moving it closer to his face until he was able to read it. The judge drummed his fingers on the bench impatiently. We are summoned here in the town of Map, of the County Cornwall, of the District of West Anglia, of the Sovereign Kingdom of Britannia, in the year of our Lord, 1599, in the Royal Court of Justice, under, under the protection of the laws of Queen Adeline, of the House of Pelican. Here the bailiff had to pause and refill his lungs. Summoned here for the disposition of Master Breno at age 12. The judge waved his hand and cut the bailiff off. Very good, Mr. Chambers. The bailiff nodded and passed the scroll to the judge. Bren's father leaned over and whispered, that's Judge Clower, a client of McNally's. Bren nodded. He had seen him a number of times walking around town with what McNally called maps of local interest. They were in fact official looking maps that claimed to identify places where ancient Celts or Romans might have dropped hidden or abandoned valuable artifacts waiting to be discovered. Judge Clower could often be seen spending his Sunday afternoons with a fork instrument that supposedly vibrated when it detected buried gold, silver, or bronze. Bren guessed it was the only exercise Judge Clower got. He was a large man with hog-sized jowls. His wooden seat groaned every time he sh shifted his lap. Master Owen, you may be seated, said the judge. They all waited while he silently read over the charges for the first time. So you're the one who blew up the queen's ship. <clears throat> Not exactly, your honor, said Bryn. The judge took another look. Ah, I see. Minor damage, crewmen admitted to, to smoking, etc., etc. Well, then, the judge started to say before the bailiff cleared his throat and motioned for him to flip the scroll over. There's more? Judge Clower finished reading the reverse side and looked around as if to make sure there were no other scrolls on the way. So, Master Owen, this is not the first time you have tried something like this. It was true. When he was 10, Brent had tried to stow away on a ship of religious zealots bound for America. He was discovered by a member who had gone below decks to flog himself, and he had been sent home with stern warnings about the wrath of God. The ship was later destroyed in the storm. And last autumn, he had tried to sneak aboard a research vessel that was off to investigate reports of cannibalism in the sea, Seal Islands. They were never, never heard from again. Judge Clower seemed to think there was a lesson to be learned here. You must be counting your blessings, Master Owen, that fate has saved you from your own rebelliousness, he said, leaning forward to look down on Bryn, his chin pressed against the roll of fat around his neck. Bryn nodded obediently at the mention of those other ill-fated voyages, but what he was really thinking that was a that the odds must surely be in his favor the next time. And what are the remedies available to this court, the judge asked. The bailiff passed him another scroll. The list of punishments, your honor. Judge Clower unrolled the parchment and began mumbling to himself. Lashes, stocks, hard labor, beheading, that can't be right. Bren drew in his breath, lashes, hard labor? He was a child. He nervously fingered the black stone around his neck. Suddenly, a tall, well-dressed man with a large nose stood up at the back of the courtroom. I want to know what happened to my wig. That was one of the most expensive models, the Continental. Bren craned his neck to behold Cloudsley Swires, one of, owner of Swires Fine Wigs, Powders, and Pomades. He had hit it big by making exotic wigs from a local breed of shaggy cattle, and he generally looked down his prominent nose at people like Bren and his father. Apparently, Bren had been spotted either sneaking in or out of his shop. Judge Clower looked at Squires as if he were just now noticing he was there, and for a moment, Bren hoped he would put his snoot in his place. After all, this had nothing to do with stolen wigs. Then he noticed that atop the judge's head was a snow-white tower of pearls from Squires' exclusive judicial collection. The judge instead turned to Bren for an explanation. A tiger ate it, said Bren, or maybe a lion. The wig maker looked at Bren as if he were insane. You, you rapscallion, you liar, and a thief! Now see here, said Bren's father, standing up to defend his son. At least he was mostly standing. David Owen was a head shorter than his 12-year-old son, in part because he had a pronounced stoop as if he were saddled with some invisible burden. Bren couldn't remember if he had always looked that way or only since Bren's mother had died. Mr. Swires, Mr. Owen, began Judge Clower, banging his gavel. 
but before he could go on, the doors to the courtroom opened, and in walked a man almost too big for the entryway. Oh dear, muttered Ben's father. His boss, Rand McNally, stood there, taking in the scene. He seemed less like a person than a monument, twice life size, a head as bald as marble, and, a, and huge feet for a pedestal. Rand, said Judge Cloud, I was just about to assign a remedy to this young man. McNally turned a pair of small, dark eyes toward Brim, the way an owl looks at a rabbit. I'll take him, he said. He's owed to me anyway. That's not quite the end of chapter two, but we just got a couple of minutes left. So hopefully you'll want to read the rest of the adventure yourself. And the thing about the wig, I read an abbreviated version of chapter one. Um, Bren had stolen a wig from Cloudsley Swires' uh, shop uh, as part of his disguise when he was sneaking aboard the ship. If there are any more questions, I'm happy to answer them. Else I hope you all enjoy the rest of the book festival as I plan to. Yes, and you can buy any of my books on the website or Word, uh, Wordsworth Books. Question for Michelle, do you think the pandemic will influence your future work? Um, you know, writers are all, <laughs> writers sort of live in quarantine anyway. I don't, I can't see myself using the pandemic as subject matter. I don't really write that type of fiction. Um, but I, you know, I'm already used to locking myself in a room for long periods of time by myself. Uh, Sonia, I don't know if the books can be found at Walmart. Um, thank you, uh, Bradley, and thanks to Brad and everybody else. I really enjoyed it. What attracted me to writing about puffins? Uh, my uncle is a naturalist and an avid bird watcher. He used to take me bird watching and I used to love uh, learning about all kinds of different birds. And then I used, when I lived in the DC area, I went to the Baltimore Aquarium where they have a puffins exhibit and I saw these crazy birds up close and just felt like they needed to be the hero of a story. If you don't know much about puffins, I encourage you to uh, watch some YouTube videos and read Never Sink. My favorite real life pirate. Ooh, that's a tough one. Ooh, uh, probably Sir Francis Drake. Why is the island vanishing in the book? Asked Julian. Julian, I can't tell you that. You have to read the book. That's part of the plot. That's part of the excitement. <laughs> but you want to know, right? What's my favorite pirate movie? Uh, no, maybe, well, I love the humor of the Pirates of the Caribbean movies, but I love some of the more serious uh, uh, stories, um, uh, like, um, I'm blanking on the name of uh, the one made from a, a Herman Melville book, not maybe <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm defining pirate movie broadly, though. But. All right, it's time to finish up. Thank you so much. I enjoyed uh, reading to you all virtually. I wish you could have seen your faces and enjoy the rest of the festival.